real life scenarios uh, almost always. This is also when we're talking about the average person, right? Yeah. In a real life self-defense situation, it is ugly. It is not technique. It is controlled chaos in a sense, right? And mindset, if you're not ready to pivot, you're not ready to shift to something different, what do you do? It's, your mindset needs to be, I have the tools, but I may not have um, the fortified mindset to be able to protect myself because we freeze up. We don't we don't train real life scenarios. We don't train the mind to uh, not shut down, right? When you're scared, mm -hmm. the brain shuts down, your cortisol levels go out the window. Like it, it is, there's so much going on. Your, um, even your sensories, your sensories, your audio responses, all of those kind of go out the window. And mm -hmm. so to say, hey, I've been training this over and over and over again in a controlled and safe environment, it really doesn't matter. So I, I'm not saying you shouldn't train because if you're going to do it, you have to train forever. Like you can't stop training and you can't just assume, oh, I learned it. So therefore I can now protect myself. That's just not how it works. So it is something that I struggle with with people because they become uh, competent to then competent to conceited. And then they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're inflated a little bit and it, it changes how it would really work. If you're new or watching this as a replay, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Please subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube, and consider, if you're able, to become a paid subscriber on defenders-live.com. Your support is the only way I'm able to continue doing this labor of love. And also, if you're looking for exceptional firearms and self-defense training, go to defenders-usa.com and look at the calendar to see what's coming to your area this year. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Defenders Live. I'm your host, Laura Thorson, and tonight we have Jasmine Vanderpool on the show. Jasmine is the co-owner and instructor at Martial Arts Research Systems of Colorado. She has 21 years martial arts experience and instructs in, a varying, in varying systems and disciplines, such as, and I hope I get these right, such as Jun Fan Ji Kung Do, Muay Thai, Savat, Kali, and Jiu Jitsu. She'll tell me if I'm wrong later. She has taught hundreds of women's self-defense classes and workshops throughout her community. She's excited and honored to provide effective information for what is experienced in the current social demographics. And she is interested and passionate about uh, helping as many people as she can to learn how to protect themselves. I'm really looking forward to this interview. Let's welcome Jasmine Vanderpool onto the show. Hey, Jasmine. What is up? How are you? Oh, great, great. So before the show started, I needed a lesson in various martial arts, some of which I never had even heard of. So this might be good to me to start off just not knowing anything. Sometimes <laughs> it's good because then I have a lot to learn and maybe the audience can learn along with me. So Sounds I am good. curious though, before we get into the, into the weeds about all these different martial arts, just on a personal level, I'm curious, you said 21 years experience. That's a long time. You don't look like you could be much over 25. <laughs> I did, appreciate that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> when, when did you start martial arts? And more importantly, why did you start? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm 36. No uh, way. I know, I know, right? I look great. Thank you. I'm just going to do my own little uh, <laughs> hair flip, whatever. Um, I started when I was about 12, 13. <clears throat> and my dad was, um, he was in the Army. He was a, a special service Green Beret parachuter dropper guy, you know, and so he wanted all boys. He got three girls. So no we kidding. learned from a young age. Yeah, just um, more of the kind of the mindset of self-defense as far as for us learning together. Um, he kind of he taught us to work as a unit, you know, and being able to I remember just like triangulating around him and then attacking from different areas because we were small. So you know, just kind of being effective with each other in communication and without mm -hmm. him noting him being a big guy and us trying to attack him. That was a, a lot of fun games. But I think when we were young, um, he was gone all the time. So I think through those games, he tried to teach us a little bit about just protection and self-defense without us really knowing about it. Right. Um, so that was something that I grew up with. I... As far as why I like am so empowered or inspired to teach all women and men, doesn't matter. Children mostly, just I mm -hmm. definitely really am very passionate about uh, trying to help them so that when they're older, it's just kind of second nature to them versus yeah. it being something that is taught later on because it's so much harder. A lot of why I decided to start um, probably like eight or nine, um, I was just, I, I don't say victim, but um, participator of sexual abuse. It was something that mm. I wanted to shift. Instead of my story being, I was a victim, I actually took that and empowered myself and became 
almost not angry, but raging with desire to make sure that that never happened again to myself or to anyone else. And at the time, mostly just young whip, sorry, young women um, Mm -hmm. that I wanted to really empower. So, but then it's kind of turned into this bigger, much better thing where I've helped a lot of people, um, but always still the student, you know, I want to learn as much as I can so that I can help as many people as I can, and then just kind of soak in more information. So that's kind of the upbringing of Jasmine today, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, very happy, very empowered. Yeah, I'm no. always curious to learn about why people do what they do. And it seems like there's always a story tied to that somehow. Yeah. And so I kind of just wanted to get that backstory on you. And, and it makes a lot of sense now. I remember when, so I first met you at a Girl in a Gun National Conference in 2020, uh-huh. I think it was this year, 2024. And you were some, you were, I, I you know, went through <laughs> a lot of instructors that week. Like there were a lot of people yeah. that I trained with. And for some reason, you really stuck out in my mind, even after I left. And you, I obviously had no idea, but You know how there's certain people that you meet that there's something different about them. And what I loved about you was not only were you incredibly competent, like insanely competent, like I'm going to put some B-roll footage of you sparring that's on your YouTube channel, like over this here right now, because to watch you in action is just so remarkable. I think it's because you are a small statured woman. Yeah. But you have learned how to use what some look at as disadvantages to your advantage. And not only that, you have a certain confidence about it that's not um, inflated, but yeah. very just like, yeah, I've, I've done this enough. I really know what I'm doing. And when you teach, you have this layered approach to the way that you explain things and then demo them and then all of our jaws drop wide open and then <laughs> and then you let us try to do it but then right. after that you build on those things like i was intimidated at first to come to your class because I, I didn't know a thing i knew nothing and you were so good about making it easy to understand and just starting off with a really small thing and then layering it to such a degree that by the time that i was done spending time with you i was kind of sorting sort of doing things that if you'd have told me in the beginning, I would have done, there's no way I would have believed you. Okay. And I could feel that confidence <laughs> building in me. Like, yeah, actually, I do kind of know how to move a little bit. Like, I thought this was just something that people who are naturally athletic could do. But some yeah. people just have natural instincts, I think. And it's really interesting how those come out in a class. Yeah. So <clears throat> well, thank, thank you, you for that. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, it was a really good learning experience for me. So I think it's interesting when you were talking before, you mentioned mindset and technique. And I'm curious to, to hear your opinion on, like, we talk about this in the gun world a lot, where we focus on, in a gun class, we focus a lot on techniques and how mm-hmm. to properly do the thing. And I think that's really important. But how much of it do you think, like, as far as self-defense goes, how what how big of the component is the mindset component of that? I know there are a lot of martial arts that are very technical and they teach you very technical things. But honestly, some of those, I don't really see that application in a real world self-defense. And oh, so yeah. In my mind, I sort of just see it as a sport instead mm-hmm. of an actual. So where's that line? And then how much is mindset involved in that? And what does that uh, look like? Well, so uh, first off, when you look at something uh, on paper, right, it's something that's easy to read. It looks good. Seems very easy to replicate. Right. Mm-hmm. And then and then you try to apply it. And this is going to be in a controlled environment. And some, it might be a little bit of a struggle, but maybe you get through it, you're pretty successful. And so when you're doing martial arts, technique is very important, you know, so that you're not injured, so that you don't injure your partner. But in real life scenarios, uh, almost always, this is also when we're talking about the average person, right? Yeah. Not someone who's been training a master or whatever, you know, because they have been doing it over and over that it's, it's like walking, you know, when mm-hmm. you are talking and chewing or whatever it is, and you can walk and talk and do that. That's great. But most people can't. It's it almost goes out the window in a real life self defense situation. It is ugly. It is not technique. It is controlled chaos in a sense, right? And mindset, if you're not ready to pivot, you're not ready to shift to something different. If you can't get your gun out, if we're talking in the gun world, um, what do you do? It's your mindset needs to be I have the tools but I may not have um, the fortified mindset to be able to protect myself because we freeze up. We don't, we don't train real life scenarios. We don't train the mind to uh, not shut down, right? When you're scared, Mm -hmm. 
the brain shuts down, your cortisol levels go out the window. Like it, it is, there's so much going on. Your, um, even your sensories, your sensories, your audio responses, all of those kind of go out the window. And mm-hmm. so to say, Hey, I've been training this over and over and over again in a controlled and safe environment. It really doesn't matter. So I, I'm not saying you shouldn't train because if you're going to do it, you have to train forever. Like you can't stop training and you can't just assume, oh, I learned it. So therefore I can now protect myself. That's just not how it works. So it is something that I struggle with with people because they become uh, confident to then competent to conceited. And then they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're inflated a little bit and it, it changes how it would really work. And random stuff. Like I used to be a security officer over at a night venue. And I did this for fun because I was still doing this. <laughs> but I was like, I just want to do something, you know, and I, I want to apply it. And I am an adrenaline junkie in a sense. I, I taught the owner's kids to black belt. And so I was like, he just lets me come in every once in a while. And so when I'm feeling really just kind of like, I want to get out there. The original roadhouse, I swear, like this place was <laughs> run by uh, all kinds of crazy people. Um, but there was a time I remember, and it was so vivid because uh, I have a couple of stories, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I would share love this stories. One. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to share this one though. Um, and, and on the, the precipice of understanding like how technique really doesn't work. And I, I, I don't want to be quoted on that because it does, but <laughs> it's so hard, you know, right. but I remember watching down a ramp, um, literally having a, a human ball right, of people and security guards and grabbing and fighting, rolling down this ramp until it hit the ground. And then it just like opened up to all these people just all over the place, you know, and like, who do you grab? How, how is technique going to um, help the scenario when you've got a guy and a girl, his girlfriend is hitting you in the back of the head, you know, and, yeah. and you've got this other person pulling you, you know, it just, it, it, you get into the fray, you just have to pivot, you have to be adaptable, and you have to be okay with it being ugly, you have to be okay with it, all your technique going out the window, and just being able to do kind of the grassroots things, right? Protect mm-hmm. yourself, protect the person around you, don't get upset and emotional that something's not working, you know, just move mm-hmm. on to something mm-hmm. else, you know, and you really have to make sure that you have that fortified mind, because mm-hmm. when you're in it, you're in it, and you make some choices, but you can't redact them, like they are there, and you're ready to go move forward with a choice, even if it's the wrong one because that's your life. Yeah, technique, definitely, there is a place for it. And maybe it will make you a little better, but you have to stay consistent. And that's the hard part with most people is they're not consistent. So what I hear you saying, Jasmine, is trust yourself, put in the training. But at the end of the day, you have to trust yourself that you can do what you need to do. Learn how to be, we talked about this earlier, learn how to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yes. That might be an important point. And then be flexible. That is correct. And then also just as training goes, continue to train, never stop learning. Don't assume your cup is completely full. Like you need to keep it empty and just always accept new information. It doesn't matter who it comes from. You know, you really can learn from anyone. Um, great quote from Dan Anasano, who's uh, Anasano lineage is Jun Fanji Kundo. Um, he was good friends with Bruce Lee. And so his and their mindset is uh, that there's no art is a true art form. Always pick and choose, learn what's effective for you that works for you, throw away the rest. But he had stated at one point, you can learn anything even from a four-year-old. Like if you're really mm-hmm. open-minded to it and you're training with a kiddo and you're rolling around or you're sparring them and they come at you and you're like, oh, look at that. Like, you are, you're able to learn something and everyone has something to teach you. So just kind of keep that open mind. But when you're talking about a self-defense situation and a fortified mind and trusting yourself, you also have to know who you are and you have to know what you're willing to do. Cause a lot of people say they would do things, you know, but they may not fully. So trust that in the sense of like, I know I'm willing to do this much. And some people just flat out, even if their life's on the line, there are things they just aren't willing to do. Mm-hmm. And I say aren't willing to do because I, you're always, you always have a choice, mm-hmm. right? And a lot of people try to play this circumstantial, uh, victimized mindset, and everything is your choice. Even when you feel not, uh, you chose to go down that road, you chose to go this direction, and it puts you in that situation. But in the end, it was truly your choice to make those whatever decisions. Yeah, we're getting kind of deep in the weeds, but I like it. That's how, that's kind of how I roll. I like that, Jasmine. Okay, so we can dial back. <laughs> no, no, don't dial back. Don't dial back at all. No, I and this is totally by happenstance. If, I guess probably not, though. I, like, If you believe in God, nothing is. But I was watching a YouTube video last night. And these two guys, one was a martial artist who had been training for a long time. And the other guy was a, I don't know all of his credentials. All I know is that he had a strong self-defense background not and martial arts background. But he, what they were trying to do was actually nail down the best martial arts for self-defense. Not just for the sake of, the, of a sport, but of actual self-defense and what that really looks like. And I'm not going to ask your particular opinion on this, but I will tell you what I learned. And then if any of it's off and you have like some something to say about it, I would love <laughs> to hear it. But 
their top four martial arts for self-defense. And this was if this is the only one you had, right? Not okay. so it's not if you have like a mixture of this and that and that, which would be ideal, right? This is if yes. this was the only one that you knew. And the uh, the number one was a tie between Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And I think that's because Gracie specifically talks about self-defense mm -hmm. and how it's applied in Jiu Jitsu and MMA, which honestly, I'm not even sure I know exactly what that is. Okay. Well, MMA is a mixture. It's a combination, <laughs> right? Okay. And I then think I'm going to transfer us. Sorry. So sorry. No, you're good. You keep going. You can still hear me. I hear you fine. Okay. Then uh, above that, which I thought this was really interesting, above both Gracie Jiu Jitsu and MMA, they ranked wrestling as number one. Wrestling. Wrestling. Right. And okay. then and then below Gracie Jiu Jitsu and MMA, they ranked boxing. And then there was a bunch of stuff below that, like karate and aikido and all that. They were like really low. They put those really low. I'm not sure mm -hmm. why exactly, but. I'm still learning like what these all even are, um, right. I, you know, unless they're like mainstream, I kind of don't even know. And that's okay. I don't have to, but I've been exploring for myself. Like I hear about a martial art, like, Ooh, there's a martial art, whatever person teaching something near me, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but is that what I really need? I don't know. And then I hear about this other one. I'm like, oh, maybe it's that. And I don't know, like, where does somebody start in the self-defense realm to even like figure this out? Yeah, no, those are great questions. Um, and I'm not going to comment on what they decided okay. as far as ranking. I think honestly, um, they're all general. If you're, if you're doing one or the other, or because they did particulars, it's kind of like, again, when I talk grassroots, it's mm -hmm. the, or I, I also utilize the kind of like the analogy of a tree. The trunk of a tree is just fat and heavy and it's got a lot of rings in it you know, and as a tree grows, it kind of refines. Mm -hmm. And so pretty much um, what I just heard was those are the bottom bases of a oh. lot of other styles. And okay. so it's, it's like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. You know, cause they, they kind of give you a well-rounded of all without like uh, specializing, right. Cause that you can get down to really fine new kind of particular styles. Yeah. Uh, but these ones are very generalized as far as where to start. Uh, my opinion in that is try out a couple different places and feel like whatever's comfortable for you because there's no rhyme or reason to things. I would say stand up is the easiest um, when we're when we're looking at women, just because mm -hmm. there's not a lot of hard contact, right? Mm -hmm. And jujitsu and wrestling and grappling, anything with that, you are um, invasive. You're really in someone else's space, mm -hmm. and if you're just not ready for that, striking and stand up striking is a great avenue to then get to that place. Because I feel like you should still have some ground. Well, just, and you don't want to be on the ground, right? Isn't that the whole? You don't want to be on the ground, but if yeah. You never, again, comfortable with the uncomfortable, right? You yeah. don't want to be on the ground, but there is a strong possibility that will happen. And mm -hmm. so it's just good to have knowledge of it and then mm -hmm. to be comfortable when someone does try to smash you to the ground. And a lot of it is you get hit and you stumble, right? And you fall yeah. over. So yeah. it's not that they grab you and threw you to the ground. Sometimes we just, we fall. We're trying to run and we fall. Um, we get hit, we fall. So it's, it's important to just have an idea. So then you can get back up and then hopefully get out of there. But right. I would say, I would say any kind of uh, avenues that uh, work, promote fitness, uh, promote cardiovascular, and that are going to promote some striking. So mm -hmm. uh, a stand-up striking mainly would be great to start with women. Men actually sometimes don't like people in their space either. Sometimes jujitsu can start to really push on the testosterone, right? The ego part of it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when you first start as a white belt in jujitsu, it's a lot of brute strength and they don't really understand leverage. It's just pushing a lot. So a lot of those things I feel like for most or the general population starting out, try something that's going to be not as invasive. It's going to be feeling more safe, like a fitness kickboxing class. You're on mm -hmm. a bag, so you don't have to work particularly with a person yet mm -hmm. uh, to feel comfortable and then kind of move from there, hopefully into something a little bit more. That's helpful. What about uh, what about red flags for people that like I could walk into any martial arts gym and unless I just get like a weird vibe off of somebody or someone's super cocky, like as an instructor, that's a turn off. But like, are there right. any other red flags that we should look for? Um, as far as studios, again, yeah. they're, um, you mentioned religion, right? They're very similar in the sense of like churches. You you got to go in, you have to experience the people and you have to get to a place where it's it feels safe for you and you feel comfortable um, and you feel welcomed. And the the problem with that is, it's, and I can't really say that there are red flags other than, you know, like they want you to sign your life away. You know, you got to sign in blood. Like those kind of like, there are some places that are a little intense. Mm -hmm. um, or they come in and they immediately want you to spar, you know, you, oh, you want to yeah. take some safety precautions. You don't yeah. want to start off going, uh, without learning how to walk or 
uh, or crawl to walk to run, you know, you want to yeah. make sure that you start with some kind of ground level. So a beginner's mm-hmm. class, if they don't even have a beginner's class, that's a problem that there is some structure. I like places that have uh, uniforms and are a little more uh, like they're just not in t-shirts and slacks, you know, kind of like have more of a disciplined look to them, mm-hmm. but that doesn't always work for everyone, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think that um, most people walk in with trauma. If they hit a red flag just by walking in and feeling an uncomfortability, Mm -hmm. then they'll need to find a different place, you know, because yeah, but that counters though, what you said earlier about learning to get uncomfortable. So where is that line? So, well, when you're, when you're learning, um, so being comfortable with the uncomfortable first, you need to find still some form of sanctuary or a safe place Okay. because you can't just, it's not a learned, uh, well, it is a learned thing. It's not something you can just switch on or off, right? You have to take the steps because if you don't, you'll probably walk away from it forever and then not really do anything um, with it. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, and I'm not saying that's for like some people, like they can come in and immediately be uncomfortable and just fight through it but that is not the general population. And so there needs to be a little bit of empathy and compassion when you're, when you're talking to the general population who are not martial artists and just, you just need to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. It doesn't work that way. Like they need to feel safe. They need to feel like they're being taken care of. And if they're not connecting with the person, then they might need to find somebody else or a safer place for them so that they can grow. And Mm -hmm. then they can step into that. Like, okay, I want to start feeling that uncomfortability because I feel like this is a safe place to start because, and again, life doesn't always work that way. You know, you might be attacked tomorrow and you're going to have to figure it out and it's yeah. some kind of game. But if you are able starting off with some form of um, connection to then growth, mm-hmm. it's going to be the most successful in yeah. my opinion. Um, yeah. well said. Growing up and, and, ha- and being young and then having, you know, my innocence in a sense kind of stripped from me at a young age. I had to grow up really quick, uh, but that caused a lot of um, stoic ism in me. Mm-hmm. And I really didn't express feeling for a really long time. And I was really closed off. My, I have two sisters who are extremely empathetic and emotional. And, <laughs> and I am such, I, I'm, I, well, I grew up a little bit, I matured, right? But as a young um, adult, I was like, they called me a robot. I would mm-hmm. receive information, process it, and then spit it back out in a very matter of fact way. So they had a hard time connecting with me, but a lot of that had to do with I didn't have a safe place to grow and to learn how to be uncomfortable with the yeah. or comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yeah. So it is something that I think um, is important, and I really wish that we would push it more with the youth because mm-hmm. then again, it's second nature. It's not something you have to learn walking into it with a whole bunch of triggers. It's mm. just learned, and it's immediately something that can empower people versus cause more trauma or triggers later. You know, right. martial arts it is the art of violence. Like you are learning and you are choosing violence to protect yourself. It's not with a weapon. It's with your own tools, you know, and right. that's, that gets to um, kind of a very animalistic nature. And most, some people are not that way. You know? Right. Right. So. Wow. So uh, I had another question and it left my brain and it was so good. Oh, I know what I was going to ask you. <laughs> I really got into what you're saying. Tell me, because I'm curious, but I don't want to prod prod girl what (laughs) what (laughs) tell me about who you were before you started to get that sense of confidence and competency through martial arts and then versus who you are now and I understand maturing and growing uh, all of that is a big part of it but I'm just curious what your journey looks like throughout that whole thing so prior to coming to the dojo that I've been at for a long time and I because I I started here as a student um, I grew up I did and then I I am a partner now Um, but I've been in it for so long. So prior to that, I was um, a very quiet, very lost and very matter of fact, but always perfect child. Mm -hmm. Like I never, I never created any problems. I did everything that my parents wanted and asked of me. I had perfect grades. Like I wasn't a perfectionist by any means, but I just never exuded my emotions like I properly should have. Uh, Most of the time, I feel like the Hulk, right? My secret is being angry all the time. That's literally what I was just hurt and angry and lost. And I never Mm -hmm. spoke about it for a very long time with my parents, but I didn't really know how. And there was a lot of shame and there was a lot of just layers of layers in the onion of unpeeling of Jasmine was almost impossible. Mm -hmm. And then I came to the dojo, which is Mars, right? It used to be high desert martial arts. And then we rebranded, rebranded in like 2000. And I met Troy and my father was great. He, I mean, he was, he worked a lot, um, but he provided and he was always trying to teach us something. So nothing against him by any means. And he showed me love the way you're supposed to experience love um, from a man. I knew that that was how you were to be loved by your father. 
but other men, I didn't know the mm -hmm. proper way to be loved by them. Right. And so when I met Troy, who is the founding owner, he's the um, one who created this place. He loved me the way I needed to be loved and nurtured that into who I am today. So I owe a lot to him. I owe this dojo so much. It has been my safety net and my sanctuary for a long time. But finding comfort in a house of violence, <laughs> you know, um, has, think, yeah. has been amazing, you know, and it's, and it's created a uh, very happy, very empowered and very, um, okay with myself, you know, feeling. I think that when you talk about the confidence or competence, it's more to be that I am, I I love who I am now. I'm happy with who I, I've created myself, like the person I'm very proud of myself. And I think that I don't have the ego because again, I'm always uh, a student first and foremost. I appreciate and I am happy with who I am. So I'm not comparing myself to anybody. It's definitely, it started with being very lost and angry to now very happy and I have direction and purpose. And that's what martial arts has provided for me as a young female to now still a young female. <laughs> <laughs> young, but older. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Experienced. I'll say that. I'm not yeah. heavily experienced, but I do have some experiences, you know? Yeah. So, um, that's, that's cool. I love that's that. That's kind of like the short, sweet version of my yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. I appreciate you opening up about that because I can only imagine the people watching, a lot of people watching are probably going to relate to what you're talking about. Oh and yeah. That's so I'm sad. always um, <laughs> grateful when people aren't afraid to open up just a little bit because mm -hmm. it, it feels like to me that especially in this self-defense world, uh, there are a lot of people who I've interviewed. I don't know how many I've interviewed now, maybe close to 200 people. And there are some that just aren't there yet as far as being able to communicate and share uh, right. their experiences, you know, and I get that. I respect that. But um, when we can see behind the what you do part and see why you do it, that's yes. where we can feel that connection with you and what you do. And I think gives it more meaning, you know, so I appreciate you sharing that with us. Hey guys, I would like to invite you to something new that I'm offering. I am going to be hosting a live Zoom call once a month for my paid subscribers. I really want to offer something special, something valuable, and something with a personal touch to you every month. And this is my way of helping you guys on your journey. And what you can expect is a variety of different topics, all within four buckets that I talk about on Defenders Live, which are health and well being, mental and emotional health, spiritual fitness, and self defense. So, once a month, I am going to be presenting some questions to you um, during that Zoom call. We're going to have a conversation live, and uh, there's a good chance that uh, the founder of Defenders USA, Adam Winch, might be on that call as well. So, I invite you to join me on the Defenders Live community. As a paid subscriber, you will be getting emails about these once a month. You can sign up for this by going to defenders-live.com and becoming a paid subscriber. I hope to be talking to you soon and seeing you in the live Zoom calls. Thank you so much for your support of Defenders Live. I am curious about your uh, journey as a short statured person, <laughs> because one of the quotes that you gave me um, that you emailed me said that levering, leveraging a situation is essential to success. And yes. you would be somebody that understands that very well. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Yeah. So could you uh, unpack that for us? Yeah. So, um, and that's, that's a jujitsu term. Leverage it is? is. Oh, yes. leverage. So, okay. Um, just the understanding of leverage. And um, I originally heard in the physical sense anyways, from yeah. uh, Carlos Machado, which is uh, when you look at the Gracie's and the Machado's, it's jujitsu mm -hmm. and both are great. So I'm not mm -hmm. going to say nothing negative about anybody, but I was at a, a conference and Carlos was teaching, but it was something that he had mentioned. He's actually small. Uh, I want to say he's probably the smallest out of all of the Machado's and they're much bigger than him. So he had to utilize leverage a lot. And the only other uh, term or concept or analogy that I utilized because I, I hate changing attire uh, <laughs> is understanding the leverage with using the crossbar yeah. and being like, say, I, I remember this because my dad was trying to teach me how to do this. And I was standing on the crossbar. I was not budging. Like I can't get this thing to budge at all. Mm -hmm. And my whole body weight is on it. Uh, I was probably like a hundred pounds at that time, Yeah. but he went over and he just grabbed another, he had like an extended bar and he popped that thing on and I, he just looked at me and he put his finger on it and was like, did this right. And it was like yeah. tink and it just dropped. And I was like, what did you do? <laughs> like I was, I was so impressed by that. And so 
Um, kind of those two particular, when I'm thinking about leverage, kind of come to mind. And it's very powerful and it's very empowering to see something that was such a struggle to be so easy, just understanding the tools of leverage and how I can utilize that to protect myself. Does yeah. that mean that if a 300 pound guy gets on top of me I'm, and, and is squishing me, I'm probably not going to be able to utilize leverage. That's where I started to uh, uh, bridge the physical sense to then the mindset of leverage mm -hmm. and understanding what that means to have more of a tactical mind mm -hmm. and not just have the techniques only be physical, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, mindset and understanding maneuver and really looking at a person before engaging if it's possible, right? Uh, sometimes you're surprised you don't really have that. And so you're having to pivot in real time, which is much harder for the mind. But that's why you need to have that adaptability. And mm -hmm. training that is very challenging. Lots of like random scenarios of loud noises to movement to you just have to put yourself in chaotic environments to train that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for me, explosive movements, um, areas of the body that are not fortified, right? or uh, like the eye, the, the mm -hmm. throat, the nose. And I, I don't know if you've, and I know you haven't grappled, but if you've ever had someone grab your nostril <laughs> and then pull it, I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. And you know, but at the same time, like that is a form of leverage where your, where your nose goes, your head goes, I promise right. you that. And it doesn't matter how big you are, you know, it, it really doesn't. Um, so there's a lot of things that I've used over the years that are very effective, uh, maybe not the most uh, refined, but at, it, when it's self-defense, I don't really right. care, you know, right. I'm going to use what's effective. Mm -hmm. So and, and, and training yourself in that. And so my biggest thing is my speed. I'm very fast. Yeah. Um, and as you get older, that's going to change. And it's going to be more on how I can uh, maneuver their body so that I can anchor them differently because people fall mm -hmm. when they're stuck in certain positions. But I still have my speed to use. So I'm going to try to capitalize on that until I can't. And then I'll learn the others, <laughs> you know, because yeah. I want to use what works right now. So Right. And that'll change over time, I'm sure. It will. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious because I don't see myself as having a lot of explosiveness. I think it's, I think I'm capable of it, but I have struggled with how to train that. Is there a way to train that to get better at that? Um, well, your cardio needs to be first off the biggest thing because yeah. you can't feed the body, right? You need to have oxygen to the body. You need to have blood flow. So not saying that everyone should be doing sprinting and I running is God awful. Um, so <laughs> I, my partner, he is a runner and he's like a triathlon guy who always, and I'm, I hate running, but I do all of these, uh, five K's and 10 K's because this guy loves to run and I love him. So I run, you know, uh, but never would I ever run from it. I'm like, no, I'm turning. I'm going to just deal with the person chasing me. Like I'm not doing it, <laughs> but having a, a good cardio base is going to be the biggest thing to start. Because all the rest is metrics, right? And it's just, you're just doing dynamic movements. And you want to make sure that you work uh, agility-based plyometric. Okay, I don't training. know what that means. Could you help so, me like, understand? Plyometrics, yeah, plyometrics is uh, like bouncing. Like, so think- oh, like um, box or, jumps? You, you, not with any actual, so like oh. think- um, Oh, what is it called? I'm on my toes and I'm just bouncing, right? I'm just doing oh. high bounces that way. So it's oh. that um, also like jumping and having just one knee go up really high and then landing. Okay. And then, or uh, like bunny jumping is what I call it with the kids, right? And and moving in quick movements that way. Th those are more plow metrics. It's just uh, small movements that help with kind of like how your knees maneuver, the explosive in your calves to your okay. ankles, being able to like condition them for quick movements. Okay. And so, um, yeah, plow metrics, plow metrics, whatever, are great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting stuck on that word. But, um, and they're, they're easy to find. You can look up all kinds of different ones. And they're very simple. Box jumps, you could add things to it. You don't need to add any kind of equipment to plow metrics. They can all be done. Uh, okay. Squat hops, oh, you know, yeah. stuff like that that yeah. are going to be, um, we love them. Let me tell you, I love I, um, uh, sprawling or what do you guys call it? You call it something else. Burpee? Oh, burpees. Those kind of yeah. things. Yeah. Uh -huh. those we call it good. a sprawl. <laughs> yeah. Um, those all help with those quick movements. Okay. And then just, you can't really train your body to move fast in weights, you have to do more of these, you know, high knees and um, mm -hmm. high heels, that kind of stuff, you know, so. Hmm. So then I assume, I think I answered my own question just when I was just now thinking about it, but it would make sense that one should probably have some sort of a fitness foundation, or at least have started one before just jumping into a martial arts program that they're going to have probably an advantage because they're not because the process of learning martial arts isn't going to be their fitness program, I guess is what I'm saying. Oh, okay. So 100% it can be. 
Yeah. Um, but when you asked me the question as far as like how to train fast movement, that was in utilizing leverage for myself. Yeah, I yeah. need the speed. And so yeah. when you're thinking uh, martial arts, anyone can start martial arts at any age and at any uh, athletic ability. Okay. I've got people who I'm and for me and let me go with children, right? I've worked with cerebral palsy. I've worked with and in kids. Mm-hmm. I've worked with um, Down syndrome. I've worked with polio, which isn't really seen a lot anymore. But I've worked with uh, all forms of autism. And when you look at it, their physical abilities are not up to par with what you would think for a fighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had I had one lady who blind people. I've worked with no arm, no leg, uh, not being able to bend. You don't need to have any real physical ability to learn to protect yourself in one form or another. That is really um, good but, to know. Yeah, and so like I had um one of them. She she couldn't use either. So the polio is what it looked like to me. Uh, I didn't ask her at the time. You know, it was a self defense class. But she had two um, just crutches, and I remember, and I was I told her I was going to do this. And I was like, what happens if both of your crutches are taken from you? (laughs) Like, what are you going to do? And I just, I wanted her to experience that controlled and isolated fear, knowing she was still safe, Mm -hmm. but having that removed from her in her fall and then her experience that and what she was going to be able to do for it, you know? And so we worked a lot of kicking. We worked a lot of on side control, like for her to be able to do something to feel like if someone were to do this for real, I would be able to do something about it. Yeah. It was very empowering for her. Yeah. Does it mean it's going to save her? Probably yes, no, who knows in that situation. But at the same time, like she had something more equipped, right? That fortified mind of like, mm-hmm. I just need to figure it out. And how am I going to turn and experiencing that for her, mm-hmm. I think was, like I said, very powerful for her. Yeah. But no, no physical athletic ability needed, in my opinion, if the instructor is willing to work with whatever um, modifications they need to. Cause it's really going to depend on those people as well. I love might that. Get little, might get a little loud. I am, I'm at the dojo. So. <laughs> I could tell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do we get a tour or <laughs> I can walk you around if you want. <laughs> oh, it's up to you. We talked about leverage. We talked about explosiveness. Now we don't have a whole lot of time left. So in the time remaining, are there any really basic self-defense uh, movements, I guess, that you could tell us about when we're just getting started. Like an, an example that comes to mind is one of the things you taught us in our little block class was you uh, had us practice getting off the X. And in firearms training, we do the same thing, but it felt a lot different in this environment. And I guess explain to people what that means and why it's important. And then if there's anything else, like along those same lines that might be helpful to people, just as a basic thing, I, or, or, I don't know. So I'm, when just, you're, I'm kinda... you're talking about the getting off the X, I call yeah. it like the train tracks, right? Like yeah. being able to maneuver when someone's coming at you and, and proper footing is going to be a huge one, right? In self-defense, it doesn't matter if you're striking or not. If you can't feel like you have a good base or bearing before you hit someone, there's not really going to be any effectiveness to it. Right. Um, so when you're talking about uh, self-defense without striking, just footwork in general, Um, and feeling comfortable with that is I think what you were kind of referring to, right? Yeah. Again, grassroots rules, you're looking at stability and then being able to adapt and feel stable and having a wide base for self-defense only because that if someone physically is coming at you, you're going to feel that physical weight. You're going to need to be able to pivot and move as quickly as you can. Even if you're not a fast person, having a wide and strong base is going to be helpful regardless, being able to kind of keep yourself upright. So that one's a big one. And moving off the train tracks is just constantly knowing your surroundings and circling versus going straight back. Yeah, Um, which a lot of people do. When you're scared, that's why a lot of this has to be trained over and over again, because it's not something that you're going to think of. Mm -hmm. Your brain shuts down and you do just gross motor functions, right? Nothing fine-tuned unless you've trained it over and over again. And it doesn't, and even people who train it over and over again, it's really the level of fear. If someone had my child, I don't know if I would have the same gross motors that I would if it was just me. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I, I can experience fear, but having someone hurt your your kid, there's a different level. And then experiencing that. I've experienced myself in those situations. I've never experienced someone trying to hurt my child before. So I can't say what I would do or how I would experience that. But training over and over and just constantly for it to never happen, hopefully. But you will have the tools if you continually train. Um, and then maybe they'll come out. But during those moments it's going to be very challenging. Um, but getting back to kind of those basic uh, maneuvers or strikings and things, uh, what I kind of showed you guys is pretty much all I would really do in a basic self-defense class. That was a lot though. Again. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah. Like a little bit of like some palm strikes and why we do open hand. Cause most people don't know how to punch. 
And so they break their hand and then it's useless, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think uh, just uh, any groin kicks are great. And the other reason why I don't do a lot of like turning over the hip and self-defense is because you're not positioned for that, right? Then to have to pivot and turn your hip to hit someone doesn't make sense in a self-defense situation if you've never done it. So again, grassroot, very simple, keeps you upright. Your hips are still forward. A front kick is an easy one. Uh, and you can repeatedly do it. So palm is, strikes and, and front kicks. The things that you taught us about deflecting, I, I don't know all the words. Is it called parrying? Um, you... It can be a parry. It can be a palm block. It can okay. be, there's so many terms. Okay, sorry. <laughs> but no, 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 that, that is another one. Yeah, parry is correct. And being, or a low block, just yeah. depending on at what point, if it's up, if it's high or low. Mm-hmm. Blocking, sometimes the best one for me which I didn't do for you guys is um, like double shields. It's just having both hands oh. up and covering this position though, in a sense for most people that, that it doesn't go right to striking. The other one keeps you still in a more aggressive stance because your hands are out and you can strike and you can still catch and parry things. But most of the time people tend to cover instead of actually utilizing striking. Uh, but if I can teach you to be aggressive and on the offense first, that mm-hmm. would be better than covering because it's hard to get out of it. Once right. someone sees, and you see it all the time in like fights and UFC fights, um, the second they start to kind of cover and stop striking, the other person takes full advantage of it. Right. They're like, oh, they're on the they're on the defensive. I'm going right. to just go out. And it is hard to get out of. So if you're training in martial arts, then do you think it's important to, we talk about this in firearms training too, but in self-defense, I've, and I don't know if you use the same terminology, but staying ahead of the power curve. I noticed when I watched you, and I don't know the guy's name that was with you, I could you could see, even though I'm not trained in any of this, I could obviously see when you were in the disadvantaged position and then when you came back and you were in an advantage position, if that makes sense, which I think is what you're speaking of when you talk about offense versus defense, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So again, um, and that's a lot of uh, shifting and um, knowing how to um, we transfer of body weight, right? And shifting and being able to kind of like move from one to the other. So if you are in martial arts or in boxing, there is a lot of uh, very small shifts that people do to then allow a certain amount of strikes or power to come up from those small movements. It just puts you in the right position to be able to strike. But when you look at um, general population and in self-defense, there is going to be times where you have to be able to put yourself in the right position because they are the ones attacking. And so if they're coming at you, you're not going to be able to go right into the offensive, right? And so right. that's a lot about energy and understanding how that works. And there yeah. is kind of an ebb and flow to it. You need to allow for good spacing, good movement before you're set up. And in self-defense, sometimes it can get really ugly and you're not always um, allowed that, mm-hmm. but that comes with training. That's again, yeah. if I can stress anything over and over again, it's you need to be training so that you can do some of these things that you're trying to, you know. Um, yeah, this isn't something effective. you can learn on YouTube very well. <laughs> no. And if you're not training it again, it doesn't set you up for the real thing, right? You know, which is very hard to um, get through to people because they're like, well, I've been training forever. But like, yeah, but how much of that has been truly applied? Sparring is still a controlled it's not fighting. Sparring is controlled in a controlled environment where you made an agreement with someone that you guys are going to still go at it. You're still going to hit hard, but you're not going to hurt each other. Yeah. You know, and, and that is um, a fallacy. It doesn't mm. teach you really about fighting. It's great because it's a tool you can use to get an, a taste of it, but it's not the real thing. You know, anyone who's ever been in a real life situation knows it's not the real thing. Okay. One more question. I keep saying one more question, but I have one more question. Uh, Do you train your students about pre-assault indicators? And if so, what are some of those things you talk to them about? I, not with children, but of course, with any women's self-defense class that I do, we discuss a lot of the, almost like a buildup, right? You kind of get certain things from certain people. So when you're talking about uh, prior to an actual assault, a lot of the things that occur, (laughs) It's mostly domestic, but it's pretty mm-hmm. rare that it's just the guy behind the bushes kind mm-hmm. of situation. And so these these are hard to determine sometimes because there is an illusion of love mm-hmm. or an illusion of care. And so, you know, you were like, oh, my God, I saw those red flags after the fact. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. well, they were there the whole time and we told you about it, but you were listening. Um, sometimes that's the same thing. You don't truly believe that they would really hurt you until it happens, yeah. you know, but they're so they're so big and they're so loud. They're aggressive. They're yelling, they're sharp, they're snapping. Like there's all these indicators that are showing that Mm -hmm. in a domestic situation that a lot of it has to do that when you're starting to have someone who's becoming aggressive, you have to take the emotion out of it, which Mm -hmm. is hard. And when we're talking women, it's all much harder. Uh, One more thing with domestic violence and I'll move on to the stranger behind the bushes thing. (laughs) You're talking domestic violence. Um, The other thing is uh, when you love someone, again, you don't have the same kind of fears. 
right? They're not the, cause it's not unknown. And so there is also a safety net with that. And so a lot of people get to the extreme of they're literally choking you before you realize like this person's trying to hurt me. And then, it, and it finally clicks, but it's too late, right? And so domestic violence is a very scary place to be um, because most of the time people stay in it because it's, they know they, they're safe in the um, idea of, I know this mm-hmm. and I've experienced this. So it's not as scary as the unknown. What is someone's worse? You know, like, well, they've been hitting you. So like, how worse could it be? It's still something that's safe in a horrible sense. Yeah, um, and familiar. that's, and that's, yeah. So red flags and that and the pre to it, they're there and they're very obvious. It's just, mm-hmm. we, we choose not to see them. Um, when you're talking about like guy behind the bushes or a stranger, or like if it's an abductee of any kind, there are a lot of very small things that occur to like in a situation, if there is someone lingering, right? They're just, they're either facing you and or turn towards you so their body is always like i'm open to you and i'm receiving you right Mm -hmm. uh so the one thing that most women do is they turn away and they they go to not no longer receiving towards this person which is what an attacker wants they want to be able to see that that they now have the advantage Mm -hmm. um so when you think about predator and prey kind of situations a prey is always turning to run where a predator is always facing their target ready to lunge Mm -hmm. and that's the same thing with forward movement so you're gonna feel like this person is constantly kind of moving towards you. Um, mm-hmm. and they're always open to you. They're mm-hmm. never turned sideways or turning their back. They're always, um, facing you. So if you were to then maneuver yourself a certain direction and they tend to shift, mm-hmm. then that to me is a huge red flag to like move myself into a, maybe a larger crowd or be around a lot of people. If I'm not wanting to, um, have an altercation with someone, right. So mm-hmm. that's a subtle thing that yeah. um, most people can see, uh, is that they're doing that. Right. Um, the other one is start like starting up conversation. And the conversation seeming a little odd, like too friendly, which there are a lot mm-hmm. of people who are very friendly, but that's why I, I don't know if you were in the one that I did um, where I presented myself as a very closed off, very rude individual. And my whole class was like, I had one lady who said that I was literally a bee. And she was like, <laughs> she was like I was like, okay, I started, I, I was super closed off. I just wasn't talking to nobody. And someone come and ask me something like, mm, like I had an attitude. Mm. And they were like, great, this is going to be our class. But I started to give off this energy of aggression and festivity. So and then I stopped, I shut down. I was like, okay, what do we think? And they were like, well, I thought you were going to be this and that you had this face. And I was like, I know, right? I was perceiving myself as a certain person. Um, when you're in a situation, you know, when you start to kind of get a very friendly person, sometimes I'll kind of give that vibe. Not that I don't want to be friendly with this person, but if I'm experiencing uncomfortability, I don't care what it's about or who the person is. If I'm uncomfortable, I will get aggressive or, or shut off and I will mm-hmm. immediately be direct that way. And if they pursue that, they're mm-hmm. like, why are you being that way? Why are you trying to? And so that's another red flag for me mm. um, because people are going to be friendly and it's very hard to be mean because most of us want to be kind. Yeah. Um, so that's another one as far as red flags goes. That's helpful. I mean, clothes, clothes are great. They, most of the time they're going to be a little bit covered up. So that's another one. So they might be hiding something. Yeah. Yeah. Or their hands are in their pockets or behind their back. Um, yeah. Or just odd movements. Yeah. It's very, it's very challenging when you're looking at a predator because that's what they are. Right. So if you think that in a sense, you don't see them coming before they've already lunged mm-hmm. at you. That's why mm-hmm. I say guy pushes. <laughs> like it's, mm-hmm. it's very rare that that's how it is nowadays. That's why I say domestic violence is going to be your number one. And there are different kinds of cues when it comes to people, you know, right? I've also seen uh, videos of predators having side glances, which I think is interesting. And the theory behind that is that they're glancing to see if anybody's around or if anybody can see them, you know, right? because mm-hmm. they want to be seen, I guess, or yeah. something. Well, that's fair. I don't know if um, most people are that observant. And so it's it is hard for me to be like, "Mm, that guy's shifty eyes, you know, like I'm not really I'm looking at the full body, which if I'm close enough and I see that and that's what I mean by like mannerisms being a little odd. Side glancing for sure. Like I teach people to side glance uh, when you do. Yeah. So I I, for awareness. Yeah. Well, and it's more, it's harder with glasses. Um, But if you feel like someone is following you, Mm -hmm. it's just the slight turn and looking to see on both sides to side glance uh, if you're trying to just slowly move out of whatever area you're in. Side glancing is good to have as far as just another tool of yours. Mm -hmm. Um, Unplugging is also good. And that's more now today's uh, world, right? We're all kind of plugged in. I don't know if you can see my Mm-hmm. Um, that's where you're, you're in my ear right now, or they get on the phone with someone. <laughs> yep. You're just tucked away in my ear, but they'll get on the phone with someone. And instead of like calling the proper, you know, authorities, they call friends and they're like, Hey, oh. this guy's been following me. You know, we get really, um, plugged into technology, feeling safe when that person's yeah. not actually there. 
Yeah. Um, so a lot of that, I know we kind of sidetracked and no, we're away good. from that. Whatever you got, I'm willing to, you know, learn. but I'm willing to learn. Yeah. Well, and, um, and there was, uh, I don't, I can't remember who the speaker was. She came up just cause it was, I was not familiar with everybody the first year, but she had talked about how we will literally ask the most obvious things because our brain doesn't truly believe it's happening. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be like, um, she was talking about a guy running across the street and he was naked. And so she was like, is that man naked? And like naked. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> like you literally see that he's naked. You know, but we, we try to, um, we try to normalize it and normalcy bias. To... That's a thing. Yeah. And it, it's a thing with, um, that's why when you call your loved one after a, um, a very extreme occurrence or a traumatizing event, you call yeah. somebody because you want to feel safe and you want to normalize it, but yeah. you need to be calling the proper authorities. Like, Hey, I'm right. bleeding. I'm going to call my, my child and just tell him I love him. You know, and I'm going to call the hospital. Or I'm going to call the, um, whatever to ambulance to come and get me so I can save my life versus, you know, doing right. something to normalize it. Right. So back to any situation again, it's going to be most of the time. And I say this for women, I don't know about men, but I think we're a little more in tuned and empathetic and we feel a lot more. You're going to feel it. You're going to feel uncomfortability we, regardless if it's uh, nothing at all. Just remove yourself from the situation. Just trust yeah, it and yeah. go with that um, as kind of like your number one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably the best advice I think that could be given on this whole entire show is trust your instincts, <laughs> really. I mean, yeah. God gave us instincts for a reason. and and We're all still animals. And so what if they're not true or accurate in that moment? Like what mm -hmm. harm are you doing in removing yourself from that situation? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. You're a little rude somebody. God forbid you're not nice. You know, this yeah, is your life. Well, I would rather be not nice than dead. So um, that's what I'm saying. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to put your website up, grandjunctionmartialarts.com. Um, people can also go on YouTube. I put the Jasmine Vanderpool 2862 on YouTube. And I say that out loud because some people only listen to this podcast. They don't always like watch it, watch it. So cool. for those who are just listening, they know where to go. Um, any parting thoughts or see, this is hard for me. Cause like, I want to train with you now, Jasmine, but you're so <laughs> far away. I'm in Montana. You're in Colorado. I know to fix this problem unless I move to Colorado, but I still want people to go check out your website um, and your YouTube channel. Is there anything that we missed or, or didn't quite touch on that you wanted to today? Um, I think the biggest thing, and uh, again, talking about like fortifying your mind, most of the time, everyone comes in as an adult, right, we all come in with our own traumas. And no matter what, I want you to think of it like your skin. And so if I put on armor, and I've got I used to have dry skin, and now my skin is always um, sweaty, or it has water on it, my armor rusts all the time. So if mm -hmm. I continue to put on the same armor, it's just going to continually rust, I need to adapt to my trauma and know that I'm going to forever have it and live with it. And it's not something that is gonna disappear. It doesn't matter how much therapy I go to or how much kumbaya I sing, it's gonna be a part of me. And I, and, and this is just for me, I truly appreciate my traumas because they have made me the woman I am today. And I've been able to help so many other women and children and adult men. <laughs> so I wanna make sure I, I, I always leave them out. Um, but I, I'm very grateful, uh, for all of my trauma and I live with it and I'm able to empower others and I empower myself, um, all the time on just being able to grow from it. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I no longer wear regular armor. I've adapted and I wear a different kind because I'm a changed person forever. So if mm -hmm. I, if I could leave anything with anybody, um, know what your traumas are, uh, allow them to be there because you need to accept them. You can try to use the tools to help you with those triggers, uh, but they're never going to go away. So you need to accept it. You need to grow with it. And you need to then use it as that fuel to fire whatever empower direction you want to go mm -hmm. and find purpose with that. Just in martial arts, find a place that you can call home and learn and train, but don't just go in and say, well, I need to learn martial arts. This is a school. Like try out a couple of them, see which one works for you, see which one makes you feel safe. And that's going to be another one, right? It's not just comfortability, but I'm like, you know what? I feel safe here. I feel mm -hmm. comfortable and I feel safe. And that's going to be where you can grow. So then you can train and you can get comfortable with the uncomfortable because that's the world. The world mm -hmm. is very uncomfortable and mm -hmm. we need to be okay with it. Figure out what works for you and throw away everything else. You know, yeah. like I, there's a lot of stuff I've learned that I'm like, yeah, that's not going to work for me. Like it's just, <laughs> I don't right. have the strength to do that, you know, so I'm not going to yeah. use that. And most uh, importantly, there is no silver bullet. There is no one size fits all. I don't care no. if firearms or martial arts or anything that you're learning. You have to be able to explore that 
your own way at your own pace, doing your own thing, find what works for you and don't give up too easily. Like, I think that that is something like uh, that happens sometimes where something is recommended and, the, and they try it. Oh, that didn't work for me. And then they like throw everything out just because of that one experience. Just know mm -hmm. that like, it's a, like you said, a constant learning. So just don't give up on it because if it could potentially save your life, it's worth it. So yeah. And comfort is the death of change. If they get to where they're like, no, because it is uncomfortable. Yeah. That's why it's try out a different one. Cause that one didn't work for you. Doesn't mean that all of them aren't going to work for you. Right. Um, I really awesome. wish you were in Montana. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. You, uh, you're a true blessing. You're helping so many people. I love that you shared your story and maybe you gave a few people some little tools that can help them navigate this whole thing. I know you've helped me, so I appreciate it so much. Mm -hmm.